Hey folks, today we're going to be looking at some introductory information about simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion is a special case of periodic motion, that is motion that repeats itself after a certain period of time. Uh, and the, the distinction here with simple harmonic motion is that it repeats itself because of a specific kind of force. We call it a restoring force that's proportional to the distance from equilibrium. So let's uh, pull that apart a little bit here. We have two examples of simple harmonic motion that we'll deal with in Physics 1, and that is the simple pendulum on the left here, that's the mass on a string, um, and on the right side we have the mass on a spring, string versus spring there. So the one on the spring, the mass on the spring on the right here, bobs up and down because it's attached to a spring. And then the one on the, the string, of course, is just a pendulum that I'm sure you've seen before. Oh man, that's dangerous. Oh, just missed it. We'll see when we uh, collide here. I bet we'll get it eventually. All right. Now, the uh, the idea of that uh, that special force that we're dealing with, uh, we have a few key terms to pull apart here. First off, the idea of equilibrium. Both of these examples of simple harmonic motion has what we would call an equilibrium position. So when each of these buckets gets to a certain position, that bucket will be in equilibrium. Now remember, equilibrium is the state where the net force on an object is zero, which means the acceleration on that object is zero. Starting with the spring, we have two forces um, acting on this bucket. One is downward from gravity, one is upward from the spring. Now that downward force from gravity will be basically constant, uh, you know, tiny, tiny fluctuations from, uh, from altitude, but so small that we don't need to consider them, so constant. Uh, and then that force from the spring depends on how stretched out the spring is. So remember, uh, Hooke's law says that the more stretched out the spring is, the more force it's going to provide. And those two quantities are proportional. Double the stretch distance, and we double the force. Right now, that spring is stretched out enough so that the force from the spring is exactly equal to the force downward from gravity. And we can tell because it's just sitting there. It's not accelerating up or accelerating down. But if I were to pull this down just a little bit, now we've got the spring a little bit more stretched out than it was, so that means a little bit more force in the spring. Same amount of force from gravity, so we've got more upward force than downward force. So if we let it go, it's going to accelerate upward. Now, it accelerates upward. It goes right past this point, the equilibrium position. It doesn't stop there. That's not what equilibrium is. It doesn't have to be at rest there. Um, it just doesn't accelerate there. So if it's moving upward and it goes past this position where it doesn't accelerate, that just means for that one moment its velocity is unchanging. Then it gets up above that position here, and now our spring is a little less stretched out. So there's a little less force in the spring than there is from the gravitational force. We have a net force downward now. And as we get higher and higher, we get less and less force in the spring, still the same force from gravity, so we end up with a bigger and bigger net force downward. When we're up high here, we have a net force downward. So that force, that net force, always points toward the equilibrium position. So when the bucket is down here, we have more upward force than downward force. There's a net force upward. Remember, equilibrium position is upward from here. So a net force toward equilibrium accelerates upward. When we raise it up here, we have more downward force than upward. So that upward force is shrunk. We have more downward force, net force downward toward equilibrium here, it accelerates downward. Our force is always toward equilibrium, always toward a position, I think it was about right here, and it grows with that distance away from equilibrium. As we get farther from equilibrium, the net force gets larger. Now for a pendulum, we have a little bit more complex situation here. The pendulum has an equilibrium position as well. That's right here. Right now we have gravity downward and tension upward, and those two forces are equal in size. If we bring the, the uh, bucket over to the right just a little bit, though, now our string points not straight upward, but up and to the left. So if I let this go, there's a leftward component of that force that isn't balanced out by any other forces, so it's going to accelerate to the left. Now it turns out it accelerates downward just a little bit there as well, we actually are going to ignore that part. So one thing we'll do here is um, look at uh, very small amplitude, small um, um, distance traveled uh, cases on this. So let's just consider the, the left and right forces for right now. So there's no, there's no uh, force to the right to balance out the force to the left when it's here. 
it gets to its equilibrium position here, it's moving to the left. Now there's no force left or right when it's at that position, so it keeps moving to the left. It doesn't accelerate for that one moment. As soon as it gets over to this side, though, it starts having more force, or it starts having a force to the right. We have a force from uh, the tension, uh, bar, a component of the tension force to the right. So we have an unbalanced force to the right. So when I let it go from a position over on the left side, it accelerates over to the right. And as we go further to one side or the other, that rope would become less and less vertical, more and more horizontal. So we'd get more and more of our tension force pointing toward the equilibrium position. So again, our restoring force grows with the distance from equilibrium. Now, a few key terms to uh, keep in mind with, uh, with simple harmonic motion. First off, we have the period. That'll be the time for one complete oscillation. So for the pendulum, the time to swing all the way to the left and then all the way back to the right and get back to where it started. For the spring, the mass on a spring would be uh, up and down. Um, but again, back to its starting position to complete one full cycle. Or you can think of it as the time before the motion repeats. Frequency is a related quantity. That's how often a full oscillation occurs or maybe the number of oscillations per second. We use the units of hertz on that, which are just the same as one over seconds. There's also an equation that relates period and frequency. We use a capital T for period, a lowercase f for frequency, and there's an equation frequency equals one over the period. So if we had a period of, say, five seconds, it, uh, we would do one over five seconds to get the frequency, and we'd have 0.2 hertz. Or if we had 0.1 seconds for the, the period, we could do 1 over 0.1, we'd have 10 hertz. So if it takes a tenth of a second for one full cycle, we do 10 cycles per second, or 10 hertz for the frequency. Finally, we have the amplitude. That's the maximum distance from equilibrium achieved by the oscillator. So measure from that equilibrium position to the farthest distance that that object gets uh, during its oscillation back and forth. It shouldn't matter whether we measure um, from the middle to the left or from the middle to the right for the pendulum or from the middle to the top or middle to the bottom for the, uh, uh, the mass on a spring should get the same number either way. Now it turns out that both of these systems oscillate with a period that we can predict pretty reliably. Um, both systems uh, have a period that depends on two factors. So for the pendulum, um, one thing that we, we might guess incorrectly here is that the mass of the pendulum matters. So if we start the pendulum swinging back and forth, and measure how much time it takes to go back and forth once, and then we take out, say, about half the mass, like so, and swing it back and forth, we see it doesn't swing noticeably slower or faster, and in fact that, that won't have any impact on the period. Stick these back in here. What does have an impact on the period is how long the pendulum is. So it's off screen right now. All I'm doing is holding the, the pendulum so that um, the, about only half of the, the original length can oscillate back and forth. So if I draw this back now, we have a shorter pendulum, and now we can see that it oscillates back and forth more rapidly. And if we shorten that even further and swing it again, we have a much more rapid pendulum. And down here, even more rapid. So the amount of, uh, of time it takes to go back and forth depends on the length. Longer lengths gives us shorter periods. The other factor that we can't really change here is the gravitational pull um, or the gravitational acceleration. Um, so if we have a bigger gravitational pull, that tends to make this um, oscillate faster back and forth. So it would have a, a smaller value per period. Uh, for the mass on a spring system, uh, here actually the mass does matter. So if we oscillate it back and forth like this with some mass in there, and then we add to this a little bit extra mass, well, a couple of things will change on this. One is that it's going to sit a little lower. So let's get this back in frame. There we go. And then we should also be able to see here that this oscillates more slowly with less mass in it. And if we take some mass out, this is going to sit higher again, so we'll pan up there. Perfect. And now when we get this one oscillating with less mass, we should see that it takes significantly less time to oscillate one full cycle on this. Um, one other thing that, uh, that matters for the mass on a spring system is the spring that we're using. So here, we have uh, a spring with some spring constant. 
um, you know, some amount of force required to stretch it per unit of length. Uh, if we change that out for a different spring, we would expect then to see a, a, a different um, a different period from that as well. Um, we can't easily change out for a different spring with this setup. So instead, if I just hold a part of the spring so it doesn't stretch up and down, um, we'll get effectively a shorter spring. So I'm just going to hold part of the spring here. We get a spring that basically has a larger spring constant here. And as a result, we get a shorter period on this one. Okay. Now, there are calculations that we can do to uh, get values for the period of each one of these systems. So let's look at those next. For a pendulum, we write this equation um, for the period. We'll do uh, oops, T, P, P for pendulum. And the equation on that is 2 pi times the square root of L over G. L here is the length of the pendulum, G is the gravitational field or gravitational acceleration. Um, so, for example, if we wanted to make a, a clock, we wanted to have a, a time of one second, we'll say we'll plug in one second equals 2 pi times the square root, and we can't really manipulate the gravitational pull, so let's try and make um, a pendulum that has the right length here on Earth to have a, a one-second period. So we'll uh, isolate L in this equation, so divide both sides by 2 pi. Before you do that, quick check here, 2 pi is about 6. It's a little more than 6, right? So if we do 1 divided by 6, we should get a number less than 1. Use parentheses on this calculation around the 2 pi. If you do 1 divided by 2 times pi without the parentheses, it's going to do the 1 divided by 2 first, so 1 half, and then multiply by 2, so multiply by uh, uh, sorry, multiply by uh, pi. Um, so we're going to end up with a half times pi, so 1.57 there, more than 1. We're expecting less than 1 on this. So 1 divided by 2 pi, that gets us 0 0.159. Units here are still seconds. We haven't changed anything with the units. Equals the square root of L over 9.8 meters per second squared. We can square both sides then. And we end up at 0 0.0253. And the units on that will be seconds squared. And that's equal to no square root anymore, L over 9.8 meters per second squared. And then we'll multiply both sides by 9.8 meters per second squared. And we end up at 0 0.248 meters equals L. Okay, so if we change our length of the pendulum to uh, about 25 centimeters, we should have a one second period, one second to go back and forth. And we can test that out in our lab activities. Uh, as for the, the mass on a spring, we use the equation Ts for the spring, 2 pi e, uh, uh, equals 2 pi times the square root of m over k. So m is the mass of the bob, k is the spring constant. So remember, spring constant we also could calculate as doing the spring force divided by the distance stretched or compressed. So that'll be in some number of newtons per meter. So on this one, um, let's, let's just make some guesses at uh, um, values for the, the mass on a spring system we have right now. Um, there's about one kilogram worth of mass inside there. And if we just time this thing going up and down, let's see... One Mississippi two maybe one and a half seconds, um, one point five seconds equals two pi times the square root. We have one kilogram in there, and let's solve for this value of the spring constant. So not a bad way to find spring constant if we don't have uh, say a reliable um, spring scale. Um, so we'll divide both sides by two pi. So one point five divided by parentheses again, not. Uh, uh, don't, can't do it without the parentheses, and that gets us uh, 0 0.239 seconds are the units, plus the square root of 1 kilogram divided by k. And just watch that k, make sure it looks like a lowercase k. I'm going to adjust mine a little bit. Capital K is kinetic energy. Sometimes we deal with kinetic energy in these problems, so we don't want to mix and match those. We'll square both sides, 
that gets us 0 0.056, uh, 0 0.057 we'll say, and that'll be seconds squared. That's one kilogram divided by k. We can't solve for k when it's in the denominator of this fraction, so let's multiply both sides by k and get k times 0 0.057 seconds squared equals one kilogram and then divide both sides by the 0 0.05 seconds and we get 17.5 and the units on this look a little funny we got kilograms per second squared now if we recall back to uh, the units we're expecting for spring constant we uh, we think it should come out in newtons per meter Newtons per meter. Newtons of force per meter of distance stretched or compressed. Well, a newton, remember, is not a base unit. A newton means a kilogram meter squared per second. Sorry, kilogram meter per second squared divided by meters. So our meters will cancel here, and we end up at kilograms per second squared. So actually, our units are okay on this. Let's we don't typically report units for spring constant that way, so let's just change the units on this 17.5 newtons per meter. All right, that's it for now. More on simple harmonic motion to come.